Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Alisa Slodzinska, and I work for the City of Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection, BACP. Welcome to the BACP Business Education Workshop Webinar Series. We have adapted our regular business education workshops at City Hall into these webinars until further notice. On behalf of our commissioner, Rosa Scarino, I want to inform you that business licenses can be processed online where applicable by visiting chicagobusinessdirect.org. And please note any websites or emails that I mention will be posted in the chat box for your reference. If you are part of the BCP Entrepreneur Certificate Program, you can get credit for joining this webinar by sending an email to BACP Outreach at cityofchicago.org. If you want to learn about the program, please visit chicago.gov backslash business education. To help guide your business and employees during Chicago's reopening process, please visit chicago.gov backslash reopening. Also, you can receive targeted emergency alerts for the business community by opting in to Shy Biz emergency alerts. If you are interested, please visit chicago.gov backslash shy biz alerts. Once again, any websites or emails that I mentioned will be posted in the chat box. And we encourage attendees to ask questions. Please use the chat box and send your questions to all panelists. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. And today's webinar, will be recognizing and protecting your company's trademarks, patents, trade secrets, and copyrights. It will be presented by Patrick J. Smith, partner and registered patent attorney at Greer, Burns & Crane. Welcome, Patrick. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, you know, this is a different format than I typically teach this class, but uh, I think we have more attendees and so everyone can be safe and, and learn a little something this morning. I think that's good. Um, I will give you one uh, personal note on the day of all days that I'm teaching this class. Uh, we have uh, some brick masons doing work on our building. Um, so I hope uh, that's not too distracting. I have my headphones with a little microphone here, so I don't think it'll be an issue. But uh, if somebody falls and yells help, I, I might have to jump up and get them. But I, I don't anticipate that happening. Uh, so I will talk about these different topics of intellectual property, and then uh, there will be some question and answer at the end. Um, I have my email address and my my phone number here. Um, if I don't get to your question, um, please feel free to to shoot me an email uh, and ask your uh, ask your question. Uh, I'm more than happy to to answer questions. Um, and as you'll see, I like to talk about this stuff, so it's it's uh, something I enjoy. Um, so if we move on. Uh, before I get into anything, I just kind of have to do a typical typical lawyer disclaimer here that, um, you know, I'm here as a teacher, so I'm not here to establish an attorney client relationship between uh, myself and, and any attendees. Um, so I'm here to give you guys information um, and what you choose to do with that information, uh, whether you reach out and hire an attorney uh, is up to you. But uh, just so you know that this is a class that I'm here to, to be a teacher. Um, but with that, we can kind of get into this. So we're here to talk about intellectual property. And I think the, the question I get the most uh, initially is, well, what is intellectual property? Um, it's, it's maybe something you haven't really thought about before or, or really considered. Um, so I, I, I think there's really three types of property. Um, there's real property. So that's your house. Um, that's real estate. That's leases. That things that deal with you know, real property, land. Um, and then there's personal property. And that's all your stuff. So your iPads, iPhones, cars. Um, you know, there used to be a distinction between real property and personal property is whether it was, you know, attached to the house. Well, people put TVs in their house now. So I guess the question is whether those TVs become real property or not. Uh, I don't know, but we're here to talk about intellectual property. And, and what is that? Well, those are rights for creative things. So you, things you create. And what's really important to know is that it's really rights to stop someone else from doing something. Um, 
So it's, it's almost a negative right. So right to reach out and say, hey, you can't do that. Um, and, and so that's to protect the thing that you create, whether it's an artistic creation or some sort of business uh, goodwill or uh, an invention. Um, and so we'll talk about these different uh, rights that there are, how they're created, what they protect. And uh, you know, I'll have some pointers along the way to help your business recognize uh, and protect these things because um, you'll see you can uh, you can lose some rights if you don't protect them or um, you know you can get into a sticky situation and it's better to address things up front than to deal with a lawyer after the fact. Um, so the the core areas of IP uh, that we're going to talk about today are copyrights, trademarks, trade dress, which is uh, just a kind of subset of trademarks trade secrets and patents. Um, they all protect different things, but there is some overlap you'll see. Um, they all last for different amounts of time. Um, and you know, some you have to register, some you don't register, and some you probably should register. Um, so copyrights, those typically protect literary and artistic works. So things that are creative that are beautiful or well, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Um, and they can last a long time. Um, and it, depends on who the original uh, author is, but um, copyrights can last 95 years from the publication or uh, life of the author plus 70 years. Um, and under the current act, they're not renewable uh, years ago, many years ago. Uh, you used to have to renew copyrights. Um, and then there may still be some older ones out there floating uh, that, that have to be renewed. But any anything new now, none of the copyrights have to be renewed. Um, registration is not required for copyright. So when you make something that's copyrightable, you create a copyright. Um, but we'll talk about why you want to register and the, the benefits uh, of doing so. Um, trademarks, so these protect names, symbols, other things that we'll talk about. Um, and what they do is, is that's to protect this business goodwill that you create. So if you come up with a name for your business and you create this goodwill where people see that name and they know, oh, I know that company, she makes the best whatever. Um, and, and so there's a way to protect that, that association in the minds of consumers between the mark, the symbol, the name, and the goods or services, that the level of, um, uh, of how, quality there. Um, they're not, you don't have to register them, but if you do, um, you have to renew the registration every 10 years. Um, and as long as you're using that mark, you can protect it. Uh, and so trade dress, trade dress, is just like trademark, um, but instead of protecting a name or symbol, it's an overall look. So it's product packaging or how the product looks or like a, how a store has a very similar appearance throughout all the stores. Um, it's the same thing. You don't have to register it, uh, but if you do, you have to renew every 10 years. Um, and as long as you're using it, you can protect it. Um, next, we'll talk about trade secrets. And what is this? Well, it's confidential information. More specifically, it's confidential information that you as a business owner get some benefit from. You know, it helps your company be a little better, gives you a little leg up over somebody else. Um, and so how long will that be protected? Well, as long as it's a secret and giving you some advantage forever. Um, and there is no registration required because you know, that would require you to tell the secret. Um, and so we'll talk about how that, that comes up uh, in a little bit. And then finally, uh, patents we'll talk about as well. Uh, Briefly, and those are for technological innovations. So those are for, you know, something useful, uh, or they can also be how something how something looks. Um, these have terms of uh, about 20 years or 15 years, depending on the type of patent. Um, and as you'll see, this is the only area of intellectual property that you don't have rights until you get it registered. So until the federal government says you have a patent, then you have no patent rights. Um, and we'll talk about all these and I'll hopefully get some really good questions about them as well and give you some good examples. Um, so we're going to start here with copyrights and uh, put my circle C. Everybody probably should recognize that that has something to do with copyright. We'll talk about that as well. So what is protected by copyright? Well, generally speaking, copyrights protect original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium. All right, that's a lot of lawyer stuff in there for very short language. Um, so I bolded some important words here. Uh, the first is original, right? So it has to be new. I couldn't have taken something from somewhere else to create a copyright. Um, it has to, there has to be authorship. And, uh, you know, 
I will say I, I like this area of the law because it always comes up in the news and typically the news reports it wrong. But um, if you remember a few years ago, there was this monkey selfie case um, and that kind of spurred a little issue as well, does the author have to be humans and uh, be a human because technically the monkey took the picture. Um, and, and actually in the US, yes, the, the author has to be human. So uh, I think where that's going is um, with AI, if people create AI to write you know, books or movies, um, uh, who's going to be the author there? Because it's not a human. Um, but what really is here is that authorship has to do with creativity. There has to be some tiny bit of creativity. Um, you know, I have behind me is this circle. Um, you know, if I drew a circle on a piece of, piece of paper, uh, I, I don't know that that would be copyrighted. But this is a circle. It's made from metal. It's got, you know, some wear and tear. It's got, you know, so there's some small artistic quality to this sculpture. Uh, so it, maybe that would be enough to be protected by copyright. Uh, and then finally, tangible medium. So it has to be in something that's possessable. Um, so obviously on a piece of paper, um, a movie, whether that's a DVD, if they even make those anymore, or uh, a CD. Um, I always like to give the example of what about I go out at low tide and build a, uh, a sandcastle? You know, that's a tangible medium. How long is it going to be fixed there? I don't know, 12 hours till the tide comes in. So it doesn't have to be fixed for very long, um, but it has to be in some sort of possessable uh, manner. Um, so what are the types of works this includes? Well, literary works, so books, product descriptions, advertisements, um, musical works, songs, lyrics, specific recordings. Uh, I, I like musical works because if you think of a song, um, the lyrics without the, the melody behind it, that could be copyrighted. Uh, the melody without the lyrics uh, can also be independently copyrighted. Then you have the combination of the two making the song that could be copyrighted. And then you have a recording. So let's say they do a live concert at the Aragon Ballroom. Um, that could be independently copyrighted. So with musical works, there's always a lot of uh, interplay between various copyrights that can exist. Um, Copyright also protects pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. So photos, pictures, movies, drawings, designs, sculptures, all these creative things that uh, you know my children draw every day. Um, if I so was so inclined, I guess we could register them as copyrights if we wanted. Um, well, then we get a little more technical, but what about displays, prototypes, technical drawings? Can those be copyrighted? Well, probably there's some sort of creativity there, um, but one thing about copyright is copyright does not protect ideas, only expression, right? So I have this example of a book idea compared with a book expression. Um, and I always like to use my wife's favorite book, which is Pride and Prejudice. So Pride and Prejudice is the story of uh, five sisters uh, in the Regency era England as they try to find love and, and marriage uh, in their little estate in England. Um, so can I protect that idea well, not really. I mean, there are a lot of common themes throughout many books that that borrows from, you know, uh, Regency era women trying to get married, um, but it can protect the expression, um, and so the specific story that is told um, within that book. Um, and so there's this kind of split between well, I have this idea for a book, and I actually wrote a book. Copyright will protect the book you wrote, not the idea for the book. Um, now, it also comes into play when you get to useful articles. Um, so useful aspects of those articles are not protected by copyright. Um, so if we look down here, I have my uh, everyone's favorite little mouse. And I choose this guy because uh, this is the reason, if you remember how long I said copyrights last, life of the author plus 70 years. Um, this is kind of the main author that drove that length, uh, Mr. Disney. So if they got a copyright on this lamp, what could they stop? Well, they couldn't stop someone from making a lamp, right? That's the useful, this is what it does. They, that, that's not what the copyright's gonna protect. But if you look at the lampshade, right, it has a really unique creative pattern on there. So they could probably definitely stop someone from copying this pattern. Um, clearly this little mouse sculpture at the bottom, they could stop someone from copying that, the mouse sculpture. They could stop someone from making this exact same lamp. Um, but in general, they couldn't stop someone from making any lamp. So the copyright's only gonna protect the artistic aspects of this lamp. So where are some sources of copyrightable material you might find in your business? Well, I mean, there's some easy ones. So your photos, drawings, music, songs, books, you know, anything you create um, is probably gonna uh, 
be able to be copyrighted. Um, logo. So if you have a logo for your business, some sort of artistic drawing that you created, um, that could be uh, a copyrightable material. And you'll see it could also be a trademark. Websites. These are a, uh, a treasure trove of potentially copyrightable material. Um, so you have the words you write to put on your website, and that's going to be copyright. Um, the source code, so the, the computer language behind the scenes that tells the, the web browser how to display your website, or the source code if, you know, in a software program, those are all copyrightable. Images that are, on your copy, uh, that are on your website could be copyrighted. But I put a note here from where. If you remember, I said uh, copyright protects original works. So that means I have to have, there has to be some original image. Um, if I take an image from the web, uh, I'm not saying that I have permission to do that, but you know, you go on the web, you do a search, pull an image and put it on your website. You're not going to give yourself a copyright in that image that you did not create. It's not original. Um, so you have to kind of know where the images came from. Um, and then the website itself. So if you look at my slide, I kind of have this theme that runs through my slides. Um, I have these two gray bars, uh, top and bottom. In the corner, there's a little blue uh, circle. Then there's like this green logo. And so it creates this kind of overall impression. Um, you, you know, if you have a website that does that, it's, it's very possible you can get a copyright on that type of overall impression because there's some level of creativity that, that existed when I made these slides. Um, it's not much and copyright doesn't require much. Um, uh, additional sources of copyrightable material, well, advertisements, flyers. Again, there's some creativity here. You decide how the font's going to work. You know, whenever we design our block party flyer, we have to get a logo and we put text up there and we add other text and add information. There's some creativity there. And so that could be protected by copyright. Um, but then you can think about some more uh, fun business documents that maybe you write. So employee materials, manuals, things like that. You know, conceivably those could be copyrighted as long as they're original um, to you. Um, so does that mean anything written or typed? Well, maybe a, a contract, uh, maybe, but probably not. You know, those are e even in my practice, contracts are borrowed from other contracts, so they're not really a lot of originality there. Um, purchase orders, maybe. Uh, you know, I think if you had a purchase order that set up this kind of like the website itself, this overall impression, if you had a very unique design to your purchase order. But the functionality of a purchase order starts to come through. And, and again, it's not going to protect the functional features of it. So, um, you know, it's possible, but, but maybe not. Um, so what do you do with the copyright? Well, this allows you to stop anyone from making or distributing copies or making you distributing derivative works without authorization. So it doesn't have to be an exact copy, right? It, it can be uh, substantially similar as the test, you know, so they, they do, they put the two up and compare and say, well, you just changed the name. Everything else is the same. Well, that's that's the copy. Um, but then I also have this bolded word derivative works. Well, what is that? Um, and I'll, I'll return to my favorite book or my wife's favorite book, I should say, and that Pride and Prejudice. Um, and more recently, in the last five years, I think, um, my favorite version of this story came out. It was Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. So they took enough of the original work so that you knew it, but then they added this whole other aspect where you know, these two originally hate each other, then they fall in love over fighting zombies. Um, and so that's a derivative work. You think these are sequels or prequels, or, you know, you take enough that people recognize and know, all right, I'm playing off the original work. Um, typically, this gets fought out in a lawsuit because someone says you took too much. Um, and so that's kind of where this, this gets uh, figured out. Um, so my quick advice here is if you're getting anywhere close to that, just reach out to the person beforehand so you can get the okay to do that. Um, now, one thing with copyrights when you're trying to stop someone you have to show is you have to show access, right? So if I lived in a cave and I never came out and I wrote a story called a Jurassic Park and it was about dinosaurs and people making dinosaurs and I had no access to the original story, I would not be a copyright infringement. That would not happen because I didn't have access to that that uh, original uh, the prior work. Um, and so, you know, this, this doesn't have to be, you know, such direct access where, you know, there's a copy of the book on my table. Um, if you think about uh, the, the song, My Sweet Lord by uh, George Harrison, um, that was found to be copyright infringement of an earlier song. 
And the way they proved access to it was to show, well, the song was on the radio. George Harrison listened to the radio a lot. And they, so they thought it just got ingrained in his subconscious. And so when he was writing his new song, that tune just was in there. And he knew it because he would, you know, listen to the radio all the time. And so they were able to show uh, infringement that way. Um, so what happens if some, something's an infringement? Well, there can be some severe penalties, an injunction. So that's like a court order telling you uh, you got to stop or you destroy a product. Um, you can get actual damages. So if you can show you lost, lost sales, you can get those. You can get the bad, the bad guys profit. So if you could show, hey, they made you know $100,000 because they did this, um, you can get those. Um, you might be able to get something called statutory damages um, because proving damages can be difficult. Um, there's statutory damages in copyrights, which uh, there's a statute and it says, if copyright infringement is sown, the judge can decide how much the damage is and it's between $100 and $10,000. And the judge will sit there and weigh the facts of the case and then determine how much, uh, how much damage is involved in the case. Um, it also allows you to get attorney's fees potentially. Um, so there's a rule, it's called the American rule. Um, and in the, under the American rule, which is, applies to us, um, both parties in a lawsuit pay their own attorney's fees as a general rule, right? So if I'm a plaintiff, I pay my attorney, the defendant pays their attorney. Um, however, there are exceptions and most of the intellectual property law allows this exceptions where the court can decide in certain cases to make the loser pay the winner's attorney's fees. Um, and that can be a very large number. And so that can in and of itself be a good remedy to have. Um, so who owns a copyright? And it's really important to know who originally owns it to figure out how long the copyright's gonna last. Um, so typically a copyright is owned by the author. Um, and that sets up the, the term of the copyright being owned, being uh, life of the author plus 70 years. So 70 years after I die, then uh, my copyrights will expire. Um, so it's typically owned by the author. Now there are exceptions. And one important one is a work for hire. So employees who create copyrights in the scope of their employment, well, that typically means the employer, the company is the, uh, the original owner of the copyright. And that plays into that the copyright is last for 95 years from publication. Um, so copyrights, all this intellectual property is like any property right. It can be transferred, bought, sold, uh, given away. Um, you can release it to the, to the wild and give it to, to people to use for free. Um, so, you know, just because it starts one way and changes doesn't mean it's going to change the term. Um, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's based on how it's, when it's originally created. Um, the other exception here for work for hire is a commission work. So the commission work is gonna typically fall into the, the, the creator, the author, right? The preparer, unless you have a writing with that person that says otherwise. So if I hire someone to build me sculpture or perhaps to, to design my company logo, unless I have an, an agreement with them or that says, it, you, I'm hiring you, I own all the copyrights as the uh, person paying you money, the designer is gonna actually own the copyright. Um, so my little pointer lesson here is, uh, it doesn't say this, but first, if you're giving people money in the course of business, you should have some sort of writing with them in the first place. But secondly, when it comes to them doing creative things for you, um, make sure in there you use the words work for hire and make sure it says that you, the, the company, are gonna own anything they create for you. Um, copyrights, but also patents or anything else. Um, and, and so we want to do that beforehand because while we can do it after the fact, um, it's better to do it upfront. Um, so copyright registration. So I said at the outset, you don't have to have a copyright uh, registration to have copyrights, uh, the rights themselves. Um, these are created magically with the creation of your work. Um, if you think of the Lorax, when the Lorax pops out uh, of the stump after the, the tree is chopped down, this is the copyright pops out of the, the work magically as soon as you've created it. Um, so you have the rights once, once it's been created uh, and you don't have to do any registration, but there are benefits to doing so. And as my first point here says, if you're gonna sue someone on your copyright, you have to have filed for the copyright uh, registration. Um, you don't actually have to get it. Uh, if, if, the, if the copyright office rejects you, um, that's enough uh, because you can fight about that and say, well, the copyright office was wrong. Um, but you have to at least file to, 
to get that uh, prerequisite to file a lawsuit. Um, and then in addition, if you're going to try and get statutory damages or attorney's fees, um, you have to have registered it within a very short time from publication. So if you have a work that's, uh, that's going to be published soon or, or recently published, and it's a very important work to your business or yourself, um, you may want to consider the registration and get it done early um, to kind of fall into the ability to get statutory damages uh, because those are very good things to be able to have the opportunity to claim. Uh, and then copyright notice. So copyright notice comes up a lot. Um, it's circle C at the start, and it typically has the year of publication, the year it was first published, and the owner. Um, I, I, you know, with the it, the uh, advent of the internet and the World Wide Web, um, I, I think uh, the copyright C is, is probably going away. Um, it is not required, um, but it, you know, it, it evidences a claim of copyright. So you don't have to put it on your photos, but if you do, it kind of shows that you thought about. Hey, I want to protect this photo. I don't want anybody to just copy and use it. Um, so if you think about the absence of this now, that doesn't mean that the work can be freely copied. So if you don't see the copyright uh, circle, that doesn't mean someone's dedicated it to the public. They haven't released it to the wild or to the Internet. Um, you know, so I, I don't think many photos have the C, but uh, but that's something to keep in mind uh, when you're building websites, especially, is that just because you don't see a C doesn't mean necessarily that you can use the, the photo. Um, so how do you go about registering copyrights? Well, the United States Copyright Office is part of the Library of Congress. So this is a federal right um, to have to deal with the federal government. They have a website. I, I do believe this is correct, but they often update their websites. So um, you may just need to do a search to, to confirm that. Um, there are two ways you could file a copyright registration. You could do it online or you can mail in a form. Um, it's a pretty basic form. It just asks for some uh, information about the author and who owns it and what the title is and what type of work it is. Um, and whether you do it online or a mail kind of decides whether you get to pay the smaller fee, the larger fee. Um, if you do it online, it's a smaller fee of $45 for a very simple straightforward application. Uh, the same thing, the mail, it's $125. Um, so it's the, the government is trying to get uh, people to use stuff online uh, and cut down on paper. Um, so that's you'll see that throughout the board here that it's uh, cheaper to do things online. Um, the, and the Copyright Office acts relatively fast compared for the federal government. So uh, when I say relatively fast, I mean eight to 14 months, uh, you'll get a decision. I recently had one resolved in two months. Uh, and recently, I think that was a few years ago, but that was pretty quick. Two months is, is very fast um, for the federal government. So I, I was happy to get that uh, done quickly, but that's kind of an outlier, not the norm. All right, so moving on from copyrights, uh, we're gonna talk about trademarks. And uh, so I have some symbols up here that you probably have seen before. Uh, the circle R, so that's for registered trademarks and service marks. If you don't have a registration, um, you probably shouldn't be using that circle R. Um, if you don't, you can use the TM. So that's, uh, you people have that in superscript next to their trademarks. That just means you consider that mark a trademark. Uh, SM, same thing for service marks. Um, so that kind of begs the question, what are trademarks and service marks? Well, trademarks are words, symbols, logos, or other things used by a business to identify its goods and distinguish its goods from the goods of others. Service marks are the exact same thing, but only the source of services. So instead of making Donuts, I provide computer uh, education services. Um, so I've bolded some important terms here uh, to kind of make you think about what trademarks are and do. So they identify and distinguish from others. So I have a little symbol that I put on my things and people come to recognize that symbol to mean me as the source of these goods. Um, and it's that connection that, that kind of, it's called secondary uh, secondary meaning that that exists in the minds of consumers that this protects. So we'll start with word marks, and I, I like to give this scale because word marks are probably the easiest trademarks people come up with, right? It's a word, um, but there's a level of protection for word marks, and you know some of them you can't protect, and some get the, a broad scope of protection. And so I'm going to kind of walk through this example. Uh, they're this text on with some examples to give you an idea when you're selecting word marks um, where I think you might want to go. Um, 
And so I'll start with uh, the simple generic. I'll start at the bottom. So if I want to make shoes and I want to call my shoes shoes, uh, I am not going to get a, any trademark protection. I can't register that. I can't protect that at all because that's what it is, right? It's generic for what it is. I'm not going to get any, any protection. Um, so, okay. All right. I, I, I understand that. That makes sense to me. We want people to be able to use that word and, and throughout the English language. Let's move up to descriptive mark. So what's a descriptive mark? So I'm going to create a shoe store. I'm going to call it shoe land. Well, that kind of describes what I am, right? I'm a land and area of shoes, a shoe store. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think that's descriptive, but uh, so I'm only going to be able to protect that if I can show that secondary meaning, if I can come in and prove that, hey, there's this association in the minds of consumers. When they see shoe land, they think of that shoe store on Western Avenue, they have uh, really great shoes. Um, if I can't show that, then I'm not gonna be able to protect that mark. Um, I'll get into a little bit uh, later on how you do that, how you show that, but it is difficult to do that. So I like to tell people um, that when you're picking marks, um, move up one more. Let's go from descriptive to suggestive, right? So suggestive, I wanna sell my shoe store, I'm gonna call it Laces Up. Well, Laces Up doesn't, it's not generic. Uh, it doesn't describe what I'm doing, um, but it, it suggests to people. So when people, when you Laces Up, Lace Up Your Shoes, you know, it, there's some sort of, oh yeah, yeah, that's gonna be shoes, Laces Up, I get it. Um, so that, I don't have to show secondary meaning, that's inherently distinctive, that can, that can be protected without any secondary meaning. Um, but because it's pretty close to what I'm doing, you know, there, there may not be such a broad scope of protection. What I can't stop, I may not be able to stop as many people as I want. So one way to do that is to pick a stronger mark and moving on up, that would be an arbitrary mark. So I'm going to start a shoe store. I'm going to call it pickles. All right. The pickles have nothing to do with shoes. I, all right. I don't think pickles have anything to do with shoe stores, but maybe they do. Um, so if I do pickles for a shoe store, I'm going to get a little broader protection because that has nothing to do with the shoes. Um, you know, the, the greatest example of this is probably apples for computers, right? No one uh, years ago would have associated an apple with the computer. Um, now, uh, I have a very strong mark. Um, but there's one step higher. I can go beyond that and I can do a fanciful word mark. So what is that? Well, it's a made up term. So if I start a shoe store and I call it Jub Jub, um, I guess I did not make up Jub Jub, it's from, a, from an old poem, but um, it's a made up word. It's, there's, there's no Jub Jub bird, there's, there's nothing. Um, and so that's a made up term. So if I use that and then somebody else starts using it and something that's pretty close to me, well, it's pretty, you know, it's not likely they came up with that on their own. So I think they're trying to trade off my goodwill and I'll probably be able to stop them. So when you're selecting word marks, you might wanna think back to this and, you know, start at least at a suggestive word mark so that you can get protection without having to show the secondary meaning. But you don't have to go just with word marks, right? So you can also have, oh, well, I guess before I get into those, word marks, they can be plain or stylized. Um, and just because you do one, it doesn't mean you can't protect the other. Same thing with color or no color. So usually, you know, if you're starting, I would say you go with a plain, no color word mark. Um, and then you build out your protection from there. And let's say you come up with a really great stylized one and uh, uh, with a really great color that you think really works for your business, well, that would be my secondary filing. But the first I wanna protect is the word mark plain without a color claim. Um, so I'll give you an example here. Uh, here is, uh, you know, a, a, this is a word mark. Um, it's a stylized word mark for this, uh, for this way that Wilson is written. And I, I like this mark because uh, I grew up near Bryn Mawr Avenue. So I always like to uh, say that street. Um, but you see, it protects this way the Wilson is written. Um, and this is for uh, sports bags, duffel bags, backpacks, fanny packs, attache cases. Um, and another thing to notice here is this section 2F. That means they had approved secondary meaning for this. And my guess is, is because it's a name. Um, if you, your mark is a, a surname, like Smith, I would, uh, that, I'm sorry. Then, um, there are a lot of us, so it's, it's pretty difficult, I think, to, to show that that's anything but a surname. Um, but you have to show secondary meaning if your mark has is primarily merely a surname. Um, but so they, I know Wilson also has plain marks on this. I just wanted to show you what a stylized mark would look like. Um, a plain mark, this is my favorite plain mark of all time. 
Um, and I, I looked this up the other day. This is still uh, in reg in force. They, they keep this going. But so this this word is, the mark is for two all beef patty special sauce lettuce cheese pickles onions on a sesame seed bun. Okay. Um, and so it, it, you know that's clearly uh, not that, that's not how you order a hamburger. Um, but it is descriptive of the hamburger, right? That's what McDonald's is selling when they sell this. So you'll see again, they had a section 2F here. Uh, they had to prove that people heard that and they think of McDonald's. Um, so I, that, like I said, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, but uh, as I said, you don't have to have just word marks. So you can have symbols or logos. So here is a symbol um, and probably sitting next to most everyone uh, on their iPhone. Um, here, Apple has a trademark on this symbol, um, and I picked this one because it says they have the color claim here. So their trademark, they're really going after this color. And I think that's because, you know, peep, this is a symbol that other people might use and use different colors. Um, and so I think the color claim is kind of important on this one uh, for them to protect. Uh, and, and so they've included it here. Um, but beyond symbols, then you could also have a logo. And uh, this is a very popular uh, one, and I hope most people here can recognize that. Um, and if you don't know, there, there's a kind of an interesting intellectual property story behind this one. So uh, and I'll briefly jump into it. But uh, so Mr. Jordan, he, uh, he wasn't actually trying to dunk here. He was doing a ballet move and jumped up. And so a photographer took this picture, and then they created this logo from the picture. And so there was a fight about, OK, the photographer, did he own the copyright in the picture and then they made this logo from that so was that a derivative work um, so again these intellectual property uh, issues come up in in real life uh, quite a bit and it's always makes for a good story uh, but anyways so this logo could uh, act as a as a trademark because people see this and they think of uh, the company that makes great shoes and basketball jerseys um, but as I said you know it's also artistic right this is uh, some sort of drawing um, and so it could also be copyrighted. Um, and so there is some overlap between uh, these various uh, intellectual properties, what they protect. Um, so then beyond the, the word marks and logos and symbols, there are some non-traditional trademarks uh, I'll just mention briefly um, and you can think about, uh, but sound. So the NBC chimes, you know, before a show or universal pictures or the, the little minions come on and they, I think it's for illumination. They, they do their little song. song. Um, Color. So there's there's only one company that, that sells jewelry that is going to use a this robin's egg blue for their boxes, right? They they will stop anyone else from using those that color boxes for jewelry because uh, because people see that color box with a, a ring uh, size and they're going to think it came from a, one particular store. Um, fragrance of smell. Um, there are some dolls uh, that uh, I didn't know this, and actually my daughter has one of these. Um, but they have a scent, they do smell like vanilla. And so the vanilla scent on a doll uh, is supposed to represent a company. Um, product packaging and design and the design of a business establishment. Um, these are trade dresses we'll jump into uh, just briefly, I'll touch on those. Um, but those can, can uh, be, you know, they're not word marks or symbols, but they can signify source to consumers. So they can be protected. Um, there's also fabric designs patterns, um, you know, they, you know, Burberry is uh, well known and, and they protect the, the patterns they have uh, because they don't want people copying them with goods that don't meet their high standards. And then people thinking those goods are Burberry goods, um, they fall apart right away. So they're, they get to protect uh, their fabric designs that they use. Um, but one thing to think about when you get into non traditional trademarks briefly is it, it won't protect functional things. So, like the copyright, um, if, if the non traditional trademark has some sort of function, um, you can't protect it. So uh, there's a there's a dispute and these cases kind of flip flop throughout the years about whether green for tractors and farm equipment is functional um, because there's a company who who sells mostly green uh, uh, farming equipment and other companies want to sell farming equipment use green and the question is always can they do that or is there some sort of function to the green is it uh, you know does it not absorb as much light energy or, or something like that is a nice to match the grass that it's sitting in or something. So um, courts fight about that. Um, and, and the other thing to think about on non-traditional trademarks is what uh, it has to be distinctive. So it has to be able to create that association in the minds of consumers, because if it can't do that, then, that, then it's not gonna be able to be protected. 
Um, so what are your potential sources of trademarks uh, you're going to have uh, in your business? Well, obviously your company name, right? That's probably your biggest and easiest one to, to think about is your, the name you pick for your company. Um, but if your company makes things, well, then the product names, right? So if I'm a company and I make shoes, well, then all my shoes or the different lines of shoes I have, those could all be uh, various trademarks. If I'm a service provider and I offer different levels of service, uh, so this is a bad example, but it, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. So if I have a gold star service, a silver star service, and a bronze star service, and you pay more for one and you get more, you know, that type of thing. If I come up with names for my different service levels, those could be protected. Um, and then logos. So if your company name and you have a great logo that you want for it um, and you start using that, you could protect, protect that as a trademark independent of your com company name. Um, and remember copyright as well. So if you create this logo yourself, your creative uh, juices are flowing and you design it, um, you could have a copyright as well. And so that's good because, you know, they protect different things and you can use them in different ways. So it's always uh, best to have as many rights as you can, because again, we're trying to stop people from copying your stuff. And the more ways that we can come at them, the better position we'll be. I keep hitting the keyboard button there, but I have to use my mouse to move, so I apologize. Um, so who owns a trademark? Well, in the US, it's gonna be the first to use typically, or possibly to register. I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, but trademark rights are acquired and maintained through use. Um, so registration is not required, but enhances rights. And you can apply based on an intent to use. So what does this all mean? All right, if I am gonna start my shoe company, I'm gonna call it, you know, Jub Jub was my example. I have my store, I start printing boxes, start, you know, put a sign in the store, but I'm not open yet. I still haven't created any trademark rights. I haven't used the mark in commerce. Well, let's say someone comes into the storefront right next to me, opens up on Tuesday, and I open the following Wednesday. They were there first, they were using the mark first, they're gonna win, even though I was doing all that work beforehand. They started using it first, they're gonna get the rights first. The way I can protect myself there is I can file this intent to use application, right? So what that means is I, as soon as I pick my name, no one else is using it, I feel like this is it, Jub Jub is gonna, that's gonna really distinguish me. Um, I file a trademark application, I say, I'm not using it yet, but I will use it. And the day I file that application is the day I have protection. Um, I won't actually get protection until I use it, but my protection is gonna kind of be backdated to when I filed. So in the same example, if I had filed my application on Sunday, my neighbor starts using it on Tuesday and I start on Wednesday, I win that example because I filed on Sunday. I get to jump back to Sunday and say, no, no, no. I had first rights here because I filed this, this application. Um, so you don't have to file a trademark application, but if you're in a, a situation where you're getting close to use, uh, you have a mark, you've done a lot of work, you may want to think about filing that one. Um, but once you start using your mark, if it's unregistered, maybe you want to use the little TM. Uh, if you get a registration, you certainly want to use the circle R. Um, I'll talk about registration uh, with the federal government uh, in a little bit, but most US states do have a state registration system. Uh, but I will admit that most of my clients and in my practice, we don't use this at all. Um, there are very limited reasons you want to do, you might want to do that. Um, you'd rather, you'll see, use the federal registration system and get the benefits there if you're going to register anything. Um, I'll briefly touch outside the U.S. Um, most countries, including most of the countries in Europe, um, it's the first to file. So it doesn't, you know, use isn't, it's kind of the opposite. Um, so if, if you're thinking of going outside the U.S., there's kind of different applications um, because different countries have different laws. Um, and so that's something to think about is that you may have to file quickly in for foreign protection. Um, so you have your trademarks. What do you do? Well, this is very important because policing and enforcing these is not an option. It's a duty. You have to do it. If you remember, what we're protecting here with trademarks is this association in consumers, their minds. They see this mark, they think of, you know, they don't have to know the company, but they think of a company. Um, and if you're not doing anything, you know, you could lose rights. And, and, you know, if you go to court and say, well, I, I've done nothing, judge, can you help me out? You know, that, that's, a, that's a tough sell for us. Um, you know, you have to do something. Um, but at, at a minimum, you have to do something because if you don't do this, you can, res you can lose rights. Um, so in the US, the term aspirin is generic for acetaminophen, right? Aspirin was a trademark. It, it was uh, 
formerly owned as a trademark, and outside the U.S., Aspirin still is a trademark. Within the U.S., the owner of Aspirin didn't do enough to protect it. You know, people were using it in a generic sense, and so it became generic for the term. Um, so, you know, some other fun words that used to be trademarks, but that, you know, now are generic. Laundry mat, um, I believe escalator was one. Um, there's a whole list of words that people had, and, you know, I, these are words I would never have thought were trademarks. Um, so how do, you, how do you do this? What do you do? Well, you can just do some internet searches, right? See if people are using your mark for, for goods that are, are, you know, confusingly similar. Or if somebody's writing about your, your business, make sure they use your trademarks in a proper sense. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in a sec. But so you can do some search, follow up, just make sure, you know, your, your business and your marks are being used how you want them to be used. Um, you know, if, if you want to, you can subscribe to a watch service. So this is a company that will watch trademark applications being filed. And, and then, you know, if they say, they see something that's close, they'll, they'll write you a letter and say, hey, uh, Pat, uh, someone's rubbing, uh, register, registering, you know, Jun Jun for shoe stores and your Jub Jub, maybe you want to intervene there and, you know, get, get some information from them. Um, and then sometimes you have to initiate civil, criminal, or administrative actions. Um, so you have to go to court or the, the police or the, you know, some federal agency gets involved and uh, things happen. Um, but these are things that, you know, you have to at least do something to kind of keep an eye on your trademark and how it's being used. So, so what do you do? What, what's proper trademark use? How, how, do, how do I do that? Well, always try and distinguish the mark from surrounding text. So if you're writing an article about your stuff, make, make, maybe capitalize and bold your, your mark. Um, you know, if you're using our website, make it a different color, something like that. Um, when you sell goods, um, you don't want to use your mark instead of as a generic term. So, you know, I don't have Uggs on. I have UGG boots on. I don't get a Kleenex, I get a Kleenex tissue. Um, so you don't pluralize it, you don't use it for what it is. Um, conversely, you don't use it as a verb. Um, these companies, they, they spend time to protect their marks here. So, you know, there's advertisements that you can find that talk about, don't go to, don't Xerox a document. No, you don't do that. You, you go to a Xerox copier to copy a document, right? This the Google, I, I, Google is one I think everybody uses. And I, I find myself, you know, I have to check myself to say, don't Google something, right? You go to the Google internet search engine to perform an internet search for something. Yes, it's, it's a lot more words, um, but Google is a trademark and, and you don't want to see them lose their rights because people have, uh, you know, kind of exchanged it for what it, what it is and made it generic. Um, Again, you have to be using the mark too, right? So it's used in commerce. What does that mean? Well, it means your mark is used on or in association with your goods. Um, so what does that mean? It means labels. It means on the goods themselves. It means boxes. It means purchase orders. You're using it in that way. Advertisements in the US aren't, they're not the best use. They can be okay. A website, if you can order the goods and the mark is close to the, the goods and you can do it on the website, that's okay. Um, if you're doing services, advertisements are fine, but if you're doing goods, um, it's much better to just have the, the, the mark on the goods themselves. Um, and one thing to know is it doesn't have to be you using the mark. Um, you can license someone else to use your mark for you. So let's say someone decides they want to sell my, my shoes uh, and they said, we'll take over, uh, but I don't want to get out of my business yet. You know, I have some other things going on. Um, so I'll license them to use my mark and make, uh, make shoes and they can put it on there, that's fine. Um, I can do that, but I have to maintain quality control. I have to do something to keep that association of, hey, Pat's shoes are the best. Um, even though they're being made by uh, Beth, Pat's shoes are the best and I want to uh, keep that quality because otherwise it's a naked license and a court could say, you've, you've given up your rights because you're not doing anything to protect the quality of the goods associated with your mark. Um, so, as I said before, you don't have to do, uh, you don't have to do a registration to get rights. Um, much like the copyright, the Lorax, Lorax popping out when you create your work. Uh, when you start using a mark in commerce, the Lorax pops out, magically you've created these rights. Um, so when you do that, you have common law rights. And these are typically bounded by your geographic area of use. So my shoe store in Chicago, where can I kind of protect that? Well. Chicago area, maybe, maybe just the north side. Um, 
you know, would I get maybe Southern Wisconsin or, you know, some parts of Michigan, Indiana, maybe, uh, I don't know. Um, but would I get protection in LA? Probably not. Um, Texas, New York, probably not. So I'm going to be, if I don't have a registration, I'm going to be stuck initially as to where I am. Um, and again, to get, create these rights, I have to actually be doing something and I have to be putting my goods in the stream of commerce. So if I don't do anything, I can lose rights. So if I, all that work I did before I sold my goods, that's going to you know, be all for naught if someone comes in the day before and starts using it. Um, so you don't have to get a federal registration, but if you do, there are a lot of benefits. So, um, first of all, it's going to be valid in the whole country. So, I'm still in Chicago, but I have a registration. I, that person in LA, that person in New York, I'm in Texas, I can stop them, right? I have a registration, and the whole country is on notice. Pat's getting in the shoe business, and here's my shoe store. Um, and again, I talked about this before. It, it gives you, uh, you can file the intent to use the application. So, I've got my shoe store name, I've done my search, it looks good. I filed my application. I'm good because People come in between when I filed and when I started start doing it, that's okay. I go back to my filing date. So these two things kind of give the trademark owner the ability to expand at your own pace. So I can expand my business uh, you know, throughout the country as well as I can get my business up and going uh, because the priority is based on the date of my application. Um, and this other benefit uh, is you can take your registration, give it to Customs and Border Protection, educate them and say, hey, this is my mark. When people copy me, this is the type of, you know, the mistakes they make and they will occasionally look at stuff and go, you know what, that doesn't look right. I'm going to call this trademark owner and say, hey, do you have goods coming in? Because there's a bunch of goods here. Um, so if you were paying attention to the news, I think uh, within the last week uh, at O'Hare, they just seized, uh, you know, a bunch of, I think they were vape pens uh, because they had Rick and Morty on it. And they, they looked at it and said, this doesn't look like a, a true Rick and Morty. Um, and so they contacted the, the owner of the the property rights, intellectual property rights, and they said, no, no, those aren't ours. Um, those look to be counterfeits, and they, and they seize them. Um, so that, that's a big benefit because you can get the federal government uh, helping you out. So what do you do about federal registration? How, how do you go about doing that? Well, uh, the, the Patent and Trademark Office is part of the Department of Commerce. So again, you're dealing with a federal uh, agency. Uh, here's the general website and the trademark specific website. Again, they change their website. So I hope those are right, but a simple internet search will get you in the right place. Um, again, you file online or in paper, same thing. Uh, online is a $250 government fee per class. So trademarks are set up in different classes, depending on the types of things you sell. The more things you sell, uh, the more classes you may have. Um, so assuming a simple red application, you're going to have to pay $250. Um, if you do it on paper, it's $350. So Again, the government's trying to shift to uh, online access as well. Um, and again, it, it's relatively first, so uh, relatively fast, I'm sorry. Uh, a first decision is going to happen within six months of, of uh, filing. And typically, uh, with, you know, the first decision may be negative. The government may say, oh, no, I don't think you get a trademark here because it's too similar to something else. Um, the government is not always right. Um, and I enjoy uh, helping to change their minds. Um, and so we go back and we, you know, write back to the patent office and trademark office and say, no, 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 we are different. Here's why we're different. Um, and hopefully then they, they see the error of their ways, change their minds and say, yep, you're right. I'm sorry. Uh, you do get a trademark. Um, and, you, you know, you can do your own search to see if anybody's using marks. Uh, and this kind of has a... Uh, this kind of has a, a, I think that's the current trademark search database you can use just to enter terms and search. Um, and so the information you need for this is pretty straightforward. It's the owner, um, it's the, uh, with the mark, you give them a copy of the mark, um, kind of tell them what you're selling. Um, I will say the, the one thing that tends to, to mess people up here when they file this themselves um, has to do with intent to use trademark applications. If you're a business, and you're filing this on your own, the business is the owner of the mark, not you, the individual who may be the owner of the business. Um, it's the business. So my pointer here is if you're doing this yourself, which is not difficult to do, um, but just take the time, look at the website, make sure you understand the information you're putting in, because that, that mistake is a mistake that we cannot correct at the end. If you, if you mess up uh, the intent to use uh, owner when you file it, we, we really can't fix that. Um, and you just have to file again, and you, so you've lost um, the, the filing fee. 
Um, so slowly pay attention. Um, if you have a question and you're doing this, um, my email is there. Uh, just shoot me a quick email and say, hey, I want to make sure I'm doing this right. I, I think that's uh, something that you know we could talk about. Um, so I hinted at this before, trade dress. This is a, a kind of a subset of trade secret, or I'm sorry, of trademarks. Um, so it, it's similar to trademarks. Um, so instead of words, symbols, things, um, it's the overall look of a store, the product or the product packaging. Um, you'll see it, it can't be functional, um, but it's, it's how things look. Um, so I have examples to kind of help you understand this. Um, so here, uh, here you have two, I guess they're called sports drinks or flavored water. Um, and so I believe in this case, it was the company on the left was trying to stop the company on the right. So the company on the left, they said that their trade dress was this, this bell shaped plastic bottle. They had similar vertical presentation of words. And there's two tone coloring where one of the colors is white. One of the colors matches the liquid in the bottle. There's a clear cap. Uh, they have an overall clinical look, uh, whatever that means. Um, and then they have a series of sub brand names for different flavors. I think clinical look is like a sciencey doctor look. Uh, I don't know. But anyways, so they were trying to stop uh, the bottle on the right, I believe, from being sold because they thought the packaging looked too close to the bottle on the left. Um, so here's another uh, trade dress uh, here. And, uh, you know, this sometimes doesn't come through very well, but there's this little navel in the middle of a, well, I believe it's a wine bottle. Um, there's no function to that navel, uh, but this company is protecting the, that, that configuration of the, pro, the packaging for the wine um, where there's a little navel in the middle. So they want people to see that navel and think that that's their wine. Uh, here's another one. So this is a trade dress that was registered. Um, and so you see this description here. Um, so it's a rectangular handheld mobile digital electronic device, rounded silver edges, black face, 16 square icons, top 12 are in black. Bottom. So uh, obviously this is Apple, um, the iPhone. I think this is the original. Um, well, maybe not. But um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things is here, they, I think they came in to prove secondary meaning. Um, and they did that by showing, um, you know, how, how many people waited in line, how long they waited in line, the, the billions of dollars in sales on the first day. So people, you know, this phone was very popular um, with, with, with people. And, and then they see this, they know Apple. Um, so registerability, it's similar to trademarks. Um, if you're using it, you create rights, you don't have to register it, but there are protections to do so. Um, but it's not going to protect the functional aspects. So if I go back to my phone, if Apple gets that, that trade, uh, the trade dress protection on the phone, I, I don't care what the phone does, right? I don't care how the new software in there works. It's not going to protect that or just the idea of a phone. What it's going to protect is how the phone, what it looks like. Um, and so it has to be distinctive uh, as well. Um, so usually that's inherently distinctive or secondary meaning. These are mostly all going to require secondary meaning. Um, and in general, that requires a lot of evidence. So you think of what Apple did, they came in, they had all these, these things. They showed, you know, the, the, the marketing budget they had and the number of people waiting in line for days, the sales the first day. That was, that's a lot of good evidence, evidence they had and they were able to show that and uh, the, uh, get a registration. And the protection is similar to trademarks. So when you get that, you can stop people from using a similar um, mark. So from trademarks and trade dress, we'll jump into trade secrets. Um, this one it, it we'll talk about pretty quickly because uh, it, it's pretty short um, because there's not much in, in the registration process, but trade secrets are formulas, patterns, devices, methods, process, compilations of information that you use in business, which provides you an opportunity to obtain an advantage over your competitors. So you have some secret stuff that gives you a leg up. That's what a trade secret is. Um, it has to be secret. You got to try and keep it secret. Um, and you'll we'll go over some examples of how we do that. So there is no system or process for registration. Again, right? as I mentioned at the beginning, it doesn't make sense to I have all these secrets. I'm going to hand them out and register them. Um, that 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 doesn't make sense. So how does this happen? Well, it gets proven in a lawsuit, right? So typically something is stolen. 
the person who it was stolen from says, hey, you stole my trade secret. The person who allegedly stole it says, hey, that wasn't a secret. Um, and so you fight about it. And a judge or jury decides, okay, was this a trade secret? And then if it was, was it stolen? Um, and so that's that's typically where, you know, how do I prove I had trade secrets? We do it in the lawsuit that somebody stole it. Um, and it's important to protect these because once they're no longer secret, then you have no protection, right? So I can stop people from stealing it as long as it's secret. But once it's secret, then I can't stop people from, it's not protectable. Um, so you want to do things to keep it secret because you have to, but you want to keep it secret. So what might be some trade secrets that you have that you have in your business? Uh, so marketing plans and strategies. So what, what you, how you plan to, you know, uh, go out in the field and what, what you're going to do to get sales, uh, how you're going to do that. Those, you know, those could be trade secrets. Um, customer and supplier lists. You have a list of all the people that you buy and sell. Um, you know, for this, I always like to think back to the office and Michael Scott. He had this Rolodex and he, you know, he had his, all his customers on there. And while that may have some level of protection, um, you know, it was the stuff he added. It was that the information that said, you know, this customer has three daughters. That customer's son plays hockey. This customer likes, uh, you know, this, this basketball team or something like that. So it was, it was that information that he had compiled that gave him an advantage to talk with his customers. Um, so if you keep that information, that's, that's a big trade secret when you start keeping all this personalized information. Um, but you have business plans. Maybe, maybe that's a, a trade secret because you have competitors and they don't know how you're planning to expand and, and, and you know, grow your business. Um, employee compensation. So if you pay your client or your, your employees a certain amount of money, maybe that's more than they get, could get paid next door. And that's why they work for you. And having employees work for you for a long time does give you an advantage because you don't have to retrain new people. And so um, that may be something you want to try and protect. Um, Non-public recipes, designs, formulas that cannot be reverse engineered. Um, so if I make something and put it in the public and they can reverse engineer and figure it out, why well, it's not gonna be protected by trade secrets. So the, the greatest example of this is the formula of Coke, right? That is, is public. You can go and buy a Coke at the 7-Eleven down the street. Um, you can try and figure out what's in it. And if I can, I should be able to sell that no problem. Um, but no one's been able to do that. And Coke's been able to keep that secret. You know, I think uh, a few years ago, there were people at Coke who tried to sell that recipe to Pepsi. Um, and Pepsi being uh, probably uh, having spoken to their lawyers said, oh, that's not, we're not going to get involved in stealing trade secrets. Um, and so they, they didn't, they declined and let them know that, hey, there's some uh, employees out there. Um, and so I'm sure those employees became ex-employees and they probably uh, had a, a small uh, legal problems that came up after that. So it, if you put something out there and it can lose secrets because it, it's out there and people get it uh, normally, then you may not be able to protect it. However, if there's something I do, how I make it, that makes it a secret. So I have the, the ingredients in a special order. You wouldn't be able to figure that out by just knowing what's in the, in the drink. Um, that, that could be protected, even if they figure out what's in the recipe. So if you have food or products you're making and the way you make it you think is unique, that could be protected by trade secrets. Um, and so how do you keep the secret secret, right? Because this is the most important thing for trade secrets is, First of all, you have to do it to, to, to show the court that I'm doing something. Um, but secondly, you want it to stay secret because then you can keep protecting it. Um, so the first thing you can do is just mark it as confidential. If you have copies of recipes, you know, write confidential on it. Um, you can access, the, limit the access to employees or contractors who need to know, right? You're, you know, they always like to do that in the spy movie. Well, you, you know, this is you know, for your eyes only or need to know basis. Well, the, have fun in your business and use that if you have some trade secrets. Um, when you have agree agreements and you're going to be uh, giving this information to employees or contractors, make sure you put in there that they're going to agree to keep it in confidence. Um, if you have uh, a computer or if you have documents, you can use password protection to protect the access to the computers that may hold secrets. Locking doors. Uh, this is a very simple one. Um, lock your office door, lock your building door, Lock your desk drawer that might have files in it. Um, simple things you can do. Limit control copies. Um, so if you know you're making uh, electronic documents nowadays, have uh, the ability to limit the if someone's 
ability to print something. So you can uh, use those uh, encryption and protection controls for electronic documents. Um, you can have an employee policy on USB drives and copying. So you have a little thumb drive, somebody pops it in a computer, takes about 30 seconds to copy everything and paste it and they have everything. So you could have a policy in it, that in your manual that says, hey, you know what? Nobody's supposed to be sticking USB drives in our computers. Um, and when you see people doing that, you just remind them and uh, make sure they're not taking anything. They're not supposed to be taken. Um, okay, so the kind of the opposite of trade secrets are patents. So patents uh, are not secret. Uh, you file a patent application, it's secret for a little while, but then it becomes public. Um, and these are the last one we'll talk about. And it's a little more difficult to, to talk about them with examples, but we'll talk generally about them. So what, a, what, a, what does a patent right do? Well, it's a grant of the right to exclude others for a limited time from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing your invention. Um, if you remember all of these rights, these are kind of negative rights. They're rights to stop people. They're not the right to do anything. So if I come up with a new drug and I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say they're not right to do anything. They're not a right to make anything or, or to, to use it. So if I come up with a new drug and I get a patent on it, that's not a right to make that drug. I have to deal with another governmental agency to get a right to make that drug. But I do have a right to stop other people from making that drug. You know, if I get a trademark, I could still get sued from somebody else who says, hey, I think that trademark is too similar to mine. Um, so that, that, you know, while that can be uh, some sort of circumstantial evidence, it's not a you know, open and shut case that once I get my trademark, no one's going to sue me, uh, you know. So again, these aren't, these aren't ever permissions to do something. It's always permissions to stop someone else from doing that something. Um, so going back to patents now. So what, what is a patent? Well, it's for something you come up with. And it, it really has to meet three statutory requirements. It has to be useful. It has to be novel. And it has to be non-obvious. Okay, so what does that mean? Useful, it has to have some use, right? And aesthetic use is good enough, right? That, that's useful. There's some use I may find, uh, some use in this thing because it makes me happy. Um, so that's, that's a pretty easy thing to get over. Novel, what does that mean? Well, it means the exact thing I'm doing can't have been done before, right? It doesn't matter if I knew about it or not. If someone did the exact same thing I did before, then my thing isn't novel. Okay, well, what if my thing's just a little different? Well, that's where, that's where the road hits the rubber. It's, is that difference obvious or not obvious? If it's a simple change, like, oh, I changed from screws to nails, or I changed from nails to glue, that's probably an obvious change. And so you're probably not gonna get a patent. But if you, it's a little change, but there's a reason that it's, it's, it's not obvious. Like, oh, you wouldn't ever do that because you'd think it wouldn't work, but actually it does and it works better, then, then that's good. And if you satisfy those three things, you can get a patent. Um, so a lot of times, people do patent searches and there's kind of two searches you could do. You could do a patentability search. So I come up with something, I talk to my patent attorney or I go on a search engine um, and I can search for patents to see what people have done before. And that kind of helps me figure out, okay, am I new, am I novel? Uh, are my differences obvious or not obvious? Um, but also you might wanna do a search if you have a new product and you know, you know, this is pretty close to what someone else is doing. I hope they don't have a patent because I don't wanna get sued. So you can conduct a non-infringement search where you search for patents covering similar things and see what they cover. Um, and the timing. So timing is important for patents. Um, you have to file for a patent if you wanna protect it in the US within one year of your public disclosure or use. Um, and the sooner the better uh, because a recent change in the law, but, um, but, but now we, we can't do as much as we could um, before. But, what happens is after a year, your public disclosure then hurts you and it, it prohibits you from getting uh, a patent. Um, outside the US, most countries are going to require that you've filed for a patent application before you publicly use or disclose um, your invention. So before you're at a trade show and kind of uh, let it go, um, you file a, a patent. So I have a little point here. You can file a provisional patent application, um, and this is like a placeholder. Um, this is like when you used to pay people to go stand in line to buy concert tickets. Um, they would stand there for a year. Um, after a year, you got to, you know, by a year, you have to decide whether you want to file a full patent application. Um, and, and if so, then, then you do that. Um, so that's one way if you're getting close to disclosure. Um, it happens all the time where someone says, I'm going to a trade show tomorrow. 
say, okay, give me everything you have, we'll file a provisional patent application, um, and we will. So the types of patents, um, we'll only talk about these two. They're also plant patents. Um, so unless someone is a botanist and has some very specific questions about that, I won't talk about it, but you should know you can, you can patent a new plant if you can come up with new plants. Um, but typical patents are either utility or design patents, okay? Utility patents are for useful inventions. So, so the functional features of a, of a device or the device itself, um, a process, a machine, uh, composition of matter, new chemical compounds. Um, those are all covered by utility patents. Um, this would also be software. Um, I guess that's a good example to put in there. If you can get a software patent, it'd be a utility patent. Design patents are for ornamental designs. So they're very similar to trade dress. It's what it looks like. Um, and so it doesn't cover the functional features of a device. It only will cover what it looks like. Um, and so it's often used in conjunction with trade dress. Um, because as I, as I mentioned before, the more rights we have, the better uh, we are, right? The more ways we can protect you. Um, and so you want to have as many rights available to you as possible. So people who have trade dress may often also seek design patents um, to, to strengthen their rights. So what does a utility patent look like? Well, this is uh, kind of a little slide with an example so you get an idea. Um, so it has a, a cover page with some biographical information, a number, uh, and a picture, if there are pictures, there's a picture on the first page, and then a couple sheets of pictures, and some columns with text, and, uh, and then it ends with uh, some numbered paragraph called claims. Um, so that's the utility patent. I picked this one because this, uh, this is a funny story, but I, I, I want to answer as many questions as possible. I won't go into it, but uh, just briefly, it's a method for swinging on a swing, uh, right? Uh, and so, uh, and you don't have to worry, you, uh, I believe this patent was uh, revoked by the patent office uh, after the fact. So no one is going to infringe this patent uh, this afternoon when the sun is out and you're at the park enjoying the spring in Chicago. Um, a design patent, uh, it, it at first glance looks similar, like the front page has uh, you know, bi biographic information, but then again, it just that's all the text it's gonna have is on the first page typically. The rest of it's gonna be figures because as I said, Design patents are for what something looks like. So it, the best way to, to show that and to protect that is by having as many pictures as possible of the thing you're protecting. Um, and so this one is a barbecue that has a pig motif. Um, and everyone should be happy to learn that this patent is expired. So if you wanted to make a barbecue that looks like a pig, um, you could. Uh, you would not infringe the design patent. Maybe they have copyrights or something else, but um, if, if that's where you wanted to go with this, um, you, you should be able to, to practice this design patent without fear of a design patent infringement case. Here's another design patent. Uh, I hope you recognize it from not too long ago. Um, so this is a design patent for that very similar uh, iPhone, uh, the trade dress. So like I said, you know, companies, if they have the means, will protect their products as in as many ways as they can. And so here, uh, Apple has a, uh, a design patent on the same design that they have trade dress on. Um, and so what's what's important to remember is uh, the trade dress, as long as they're using that trade dress, that could last forever. Design patent is only going to last for 15 years. Um, and so, you know, there, and there are other things to protect. The trade dress, you protect someone from confusingly similar. Design patent, you just protect this, this design. So if someone's using that, that doesn't have to be a confusingly similar manner. It's, they're using this. Um, that's what you're going to protect. So there are pluses and benefits to both. And, and if you have the opportunity, you might want to uh, approach them both. So what, what could be patentable? What, what, where might we find this? So it used to be, this is from an old case, but anything man-made under the sun that meets the statutory requirements. Uh, okay, I, I don't know what that means, but you know, it, it does kind of mean anything, right? So a product, item, device, thing, anything you make could potentially be patentable. Um, processes as well. So the way I make my drink could be a, a, a patentable as well. Um, or, you know, it used to be people would get uh, business method patents, so the way I do my business. Uh, and, and that's kind of gone uh, to the, on the wayside. It, people aren't able to get patents on that anymore. Um, but that falls into this uh, topic of computer software. And um, let's say it, computer software used to be relatively straightforward to get patents on. And then um, it became very difficult to get patents for computer software. 
And currently it is, it's, it's significantly easier than it was um, to do that. But getting a, a patent on computer software can be pretty tricky. Um, you have to make sure your application is pretty robust and you're, you're pretty tailored to what you're doing. Um, computer software can also be protected by copyright, but remember, it's only gonna protect the expression. So if I come up with some computer software and I file for copyright, I'm only gonna protect people from copying my expression. If they, of their own accord, come up with software that does the exact same thing, but you know, they didn't copy mine, then I can't stop them. Patents will, do the, will, do, will be able to do that. So if I do computer software and protect that with a patent, and someone comes up with computer software that does the exact same thing, and then it doesn't have to be a copy, they could have come up with it on their own, but they do the same thing that I do, well, I can stop them with a patent. So there are benefits to doing it. Com I mean, computer software is just registering. Um, for a copyright, but with a patent, you have to go through prosecution and that's, um, that's long uh, and, and difficult. So notice and infringement are, are some topics we should talk about. So patented things, uh, inventions, designs are typically marked with a patent number or with the term patent pending. Um, and this is to put us on notice that, hey, this thing has, there's a patent out here. You can't just make this thing. Um, and so you can find it, look it up and see what it is, see what it protects. And then maybe you say, you know what, that doesn't, uh, it's fine, I can make it. Um, the, and the other reason, uh, the statute requires you to do this, uh, otherwise you can't get damages uh, until someone's on actual notice. So if you have stuff that's patented, you should be marking your product or the packaging with the patent number, otherwise um, your ability to get damages is gonna be significantly impacted. Um, and so it's an infringement if someone makes, uses, sells, offer for sales, <laughs> your invention without your permission. Um, they don't have to know, about it. There's, there's, there's no knowledge requirement here, um, but if they know about it and they do it anyways and they didn't take any steps and, you know, they just said, uh, forget Pat, um, the damages can be worse. So what, what kind of damages are we talking about? Well, money damages. Um, that's, that's the big one. Um, you know, when the cell phone cases were going on, you know, the damages, it seemed like every day there were uh, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in damages being awarded for patent infringement. Um, and excuse me, and, and you know, and if you're the person acting with disregard, that can be tripled, or trebled. Um, so that that could be a very large number. Um, and the way you can do that is you could uh, mitigate that with a, a, a lawyer's opinion that says, no, no, Pat, uh, what you're going to make, you won't infringe that for these reasons. And, and even if I'm ultimately found to infringe, at least a court's going to say, well, they went out, talked to a lawyer. Sometimes lawyers are wrong. Uh, you know, the judge disagrees, but uh, you know that that kind of tempers and avoids any any triple damages that might occur. Um, and then you, people often get uh, attorney's fees uh, from, uh, from these cases. So this is another uh, kind of uh, uh, doesn't follow the American rule where uh, if you win, the judge can decide whether or not to give you attorney's fees. Um, and then finally, um, an injunction. Again, that's a court order uh, making a, ordering a party to do something or to to give something uh, to, to someone else, like to give up their goods or services or uh, to stop doing something. Um, so again, that's a pretty big, uh, a big remedy. Um, and so who owns a who owns patent for the invention? Well, typically uh, patents and the invention are, are gonna be owned by the inventor, uh, but it could also be an employer. So the general rule is the inventor is the owner initially, um, but if you're an employee and a part of your job is to invent things, well, then it's probably likely that the employer who you work for is going to be the uh, original owner of the patent. Um, but again, this is going to depend on uh, 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 an agreement, really. And so, again, this goes back to your agreements with people. You want to make sure you put in your agreement that um, that you have uh, that you get any rights for things that people create. Um, it's very important that that occurs beforehand because it's just easier to deal with it beforehand than after the fact. Um, there is this little caveat, uh, you know, this is all based on uh, different states' laws, actually. So even though patents are federal rights, um, this kind of all follows states' rights as to ownership uh, initially. Um, Illinois has this Employee Inventions Act, and what's, that's there to protect people from, um, they have these agreements with their employers that say that they can, uh, that they, the employers own the inventions. Well, the Employee Inventions Act says, okay, but if this employee is a tinkerer, if they do things, and they want, uh, you know, they want to do them in their garage at home at night. Just because they have that agreement doesn't mean the employer 
gets that uh, that rights to that to that invention, right? That's the employee acting on their own. They the employee still gets to protect that and own that. Um, so how do you get a patent? Um, as I said, patent. This is the only one that you have to have registration, right? You're not going to get any patent rights until the government says, "I have you. I give patent rights." Um, and I will say obtaining a patent can be costly and takes time, especially compared to these other areas of intellectual property. Um, and while there is no renewal for a patent, um, utility patents require you to pay maintenance fees every four years. So it's like the, the patent office checking to make sure that you have, uh, that you still wanna enforce this patent because otherwise they want people out there freely practicing your invention. Um, so to keep it going, you have to do that. Um, and when you get a patent, it's, it, again, it's not a right to, to you to, to make the product. You may have to deal with some other, um, some other governmental agency to, to figure that out. However, um, it, and it doesn't require you to actually do it. So if I get a patent on a drug, I don't have to make the drug ever. Um, my patent will allow me to stop people from using the drug. Uh, and uh, it, when you come up with something, you know, I, I get this question a lot. It, do I have to have a prototype or do I have to you know, be able to make it before I can file for a patent? The answer is no, you don't have to have anything done. If you can talk about it with me, describe it, uh, you know, make some drawings and show, and we can explain how someone can make it, um, then that's fine. So you don't have to you know, wait for the prototypes uh, to file for a patent. Um, and you know, finally, the protection of a patent is, always, is defined by these claims. So at the end of the patent, there are numbered paragraphs they're written in a very awkward language that's, that can be difficult to understand. Um, most of the time it's intentionally written that way. Um, and the claims, what they speak of may differ from what the pictures in a utility patent show. So sometimes they, you know, it doesn't matter what the pictures show, it's what the claims say. Um, and so uh, kind of reading and understanding these patents is, is uh, it, it can take time and it can be difficult, but um, you know, it can also help you put your kids to bed because it's pretty boring sometimes. Um, so what's what's the process like? Um, so the patent application process, again, you're going to deal with a Department of the Commerce, which is a federal agency. Uh, again, the, the website, the patent specific website, I, I believe that's the current accurate one. Um, once again, you can file online or in paper. Um, I have the prices here, the, the, the government fees for filing online. Um, and I think currently this is about, it's $860 for a small entity, so a small individual inventor or a small company to file for a utility application. Um, and so from my practice, you know, typical patent application uh, fees uh, for preparing a patent application are between five and $10,000. Um, I, I formerly was a chemist, so I do uh, chemical things. Um, and those can be pretty complicated. Those tend to be, uh, higher end things, you know, mechanical devices, stuff like that, they tend to be um, on the lower end because they don't take as much time. Um, you don't have to do a search, the searches I talked about before, but uh, you know, it, I often recommend it. Um, you know, it, doing a search is like insurance. Um, you, you don't won't necessarily like to pay for it to be done, but it can save you, um, it can save you some headaches and, and, and you know, kind of help you uh, avoid spending too much money uh, at the outset of something's done before. So there's, um, so there's the, the, the PTO's uh, search engine is, is through this link. Um, but then there's also, uh, Google has a, a way to search patents. And uh, honestly, uh, I would recommend you use that if you want to ever search some patents. Um, I like that, I, I use it in my practice. Um, it's, it's just uh, a little more straightforward, I think, uh, than the patent office's one. Um, so you, you've, you file your patent, you get it set, you file it. What do you do? You do nothing for about 18 to 24 months, sometimes longer. Um, the patent office has gotten a lot better. Um, you know, they are acting, uh, you know, I've had cases act much more quickly recently than, than in the past. There was a, a fire uh, hiring freeze for a while and, and things took a long time, but now they're, they're back to acting pretty quickly. Uh, more quickly than they were. So, but what happens? You file. Um, most cases, the patent office comes back and says, "Oh, I'm sorry. Nope, you don't get a patent because either someone did this before, or your your differences are not that special." Um, and again, we just simply have to convince the federal government uh, and the errors of their way, and we go back and forth. Um, 
but that can take a long time. Um, and after you file your patent there, you're gonna often pay fees throughout the prosecution at different stages. Once they approve the patent, you have to pay a fee to grant the patent. Um, and then, like I said, for a utility patent, once you have it every four years, uh, so, so three times throughout the life of a patent, you're gonna have to pay the, the maintenance fees so that the government knows um, you're still interested in protecting this, this invention on this patent. Um, so I mentioned the utility patent uh, filing fees just for your information, a provisional patent application for a small entity, it's just $150 filing fee. Um, and so, like I said, that's that case where typically someone's getting ready to show something or deal with someone. It's always better to have something on file first with the patent office. So um, that's something you could do. Um, and then a design patent um, that is lower as well. The fees are lower as well. And that's mainly because the design patents, again, are the text isn't big, so there's not as much to read. Uh, and the, so the filing fee is smaller because they, they're really just looking at the drawings. Um, and most of the time for those, uh, it's issues in the drawings and you just have to clean up and the government wants the drawings a certain way because the drawings uh, indicate certain things. Um, but that kind of covers the patent application process. Um, and so at this point, I think, um, you know, I, I'm, I saw a bunch of questions pop up along the way here. And so I'm, I'm ready to get in and try and answer as many questions as I can. Um, I just have to circle back to my, uh, my, uh, Disclaimer here that I'm the teacher of the class, not the lawyer for everybody here. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to answer questions in the hypothetical situations that they're presented to me and uh, hopefully everyone gets a, a, a good answer. But if not, um, Yes, Patrick, yeah. thank you so much uh, for presenting with us today. You covered a lot of information. So thank you so much. We are going to open it up for questions. And I do want to mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash Chicago BACP. And if we don't get to your questions, Patrick, what is the best contact information for you? Um, well, I think uh, like a lot of people, I'm currently out of the office, um, mm -hmm. assisting people from my home. Um, so email is the best. Uh, if you shoot me an email, I think, uh, I don't, you know, I, before I know the oh, there it is. stuff, but uh, it's just psmith at gbc.law. Um, you know, feel free to shoot me an email if I don't get an answer to your question. Um, my direct number is here. I still get voicemails and, and whatnot. So um, I just, uh, I don't wanna look at myself this whole time. So I'm gonna change the slide back. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. And I did yeah. post uh, Patrick's email in the chat box. So right. everyone can reference it there. And let's get to it. If you have not sent your question in, please do so in the chat box. And we will do our best to get to your question. Let's see. Uh, first question is, I have a greeting card company. I have a greeting card company. Should I be concerned with having the words on my cards copyrighted with the Library of Congress? Right. So again, um, so for copyrights, you don't have to file uh, to protect, uh, right? When, when you make your greeting card or when you make your work, you know, it's the Lorax, it's the little guy popping out magically, you've created these rights. So whatever creativity you've done. Um, and, and, you know, I think for a greeting card, because the words are typically short, I would think that you may want to protect like the entire greeting card. So the, the artistic things you did to the greeting card, maybe even the font, um, to give yourself a little better claim of creativity. I, you know, a poem can be short and have some creativity as well. Um, and so if it's a very popular greeting card, well, let's say you make one that just sells like hotcakes and everybody loves it and they think it's hilarious. It's a Chicago base that makes a funny joke about Lakeshore Drive or something. Um, if you're finding that, that that's in demand, um, that you may wanna pick that one and say, you know what, I, I, you know, I make hundreds of cards. I don't wanna trademark or copyright them all, but you may wanna pick your one or two best sellers and file um, because then, you know, and, and file relatively quickly after publishing the first time because that that gives us that the opportunities to get better uh remedies and that's that's you know those are the those are the big muscles we need when we go talk to people and ask them to stop copying your cards mm -hmm. our next question can you trademark a word that you spell differently for example the word shoes with a z at the end okay uh, you know i saw that one pop up when i was when i was uh, talking and so uh 
That's a, that's a, a, an interesting question, but no. So when the trademark office does this is they're going to look at, you know, the, how do you spell it, but also how does it sound? So what does it sound like when I pronounce it? So if you change the phonetic spelling, um, they'll say, yeah, okay. The shoes is not a word, but that sounds exactly like shoes. Um, and so I don't, they, I think it'd be a, a tough sell to convince someone of just that word. Um, you know, maybe if you had it, you know, like maybe you did some real cool graffiti way you had it shoes with the colors and the S and the Z are the same size. And, you know, maybe it's shaped like a shoe. If you did that, I think we'd be in a good position, but just the, the plain word by itself. If it sounds like shoes, uh, it's probably not going to get very far with the trademark office. Good. Uh, next question is you mentioned patenting or copywriting websites and source codes. How would you copyright mobile apps? um so mobile apps so you know if there is source code for the, the the computer program um you can you can do that either way so you can you print out the source code and i think it was uh the first 50 pages and the last 50 pages of the source code and you send that in to register it as a copyright um if it's a patent application you we write a patent and describe what the app does so you have uh, an input module that does this a computation module that does this and we describe all that, we file for that, and, and you do it. Um, if, your, if your app has a, a little logo that you like, you know, we can file for a trademark on the logo. So, you know, the mobile app uh, could have a lot of different, um, a, a lot of different intellectual property coming into play, um, but it, it just kind of depends on what, what, is, what else is out there, because if, if it's an app that everybody has an app that does something just like it. Well, we're probably not going to get a patent, so we don't want to file for a patent because that's just a waste of uh, your resources. Um, so we may just want to go for the trademark um, or I'm, I'm sorry, the copyright. So uh, it just depends um, you know, really on what else is out there, uh, how you're going to want to protect that. Good. Uh, next question. Should you protect your business name by copywriting or trademarking it? So the name is going to be uh, a trademark right the name is what distinguishes your goods and services from the others um you know copyrights i've said it it doesn't take much creativity so you know a one word name or two word name is not going to be protected by copyright um, you're going to have to show a little more and so um, i don't think a company name absent like a really long company name like maybe the mcdonald's could have copyrighted to all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, onions, pickles, on a sesame seed bun. Um, you know, that's a really long word. It's kind of interesting, but, um, but otherwise the, the company name should be protected by trademark. Got it. Um, by any chance, do you know the fee to subscribe to watch service? To the, for the trademark watch service, I do not. Um, but if you shoot me an email, um, I will, I can check and ask someone. Um, and then give you a, an answer uh, for one of my partners who does a lot of that. Um, she'll know an answer pretty quickly. Great. A uh, question of if you do a trademark registration and they come back and the decision is denied, do you get your money back? Uh, unfortunately not. Um, there are very few instances here where we pay money to the government and they will give us back. Um, it is. Uh, on the patent side, it is possible if you file and then all of a sudden you um, you need uh, you decide to kind of pull it from application uh, pull and give up. Um, you may get some money back, but uh, on the trademark side, no. Once you file, um, that that's the government's money. Mm -hmm. If your business is based on a concept of three common terms such as care, create, and coach, how would you protect this phase? This phrase slash specific group of words should they be made into a logo for further protection? Um, so if if you're using common terms for your uh, business name, that's okay, right? Again, um, in my examples, you know, generic terms not okay, right? So uh, you know, I, I and I, and just looking at care, create, and coach, I, I don't know anything that that describes generically. I can't think of any product. Um, that that's generic, you know, it's not a coffee cup or something like that. Um, so maybe, maybe it's descriptive. Um, it's which again, people like to use descriptive marks and that's okay. Um, your, your scope of protection is small and, you know, you're going to have to show you've been using it for a while. You spent, you know, time and money. 
Um, so they can be protected um, by trademarks. But um, you know, if you come up with a logo for that and put them in a, a special design and, and an arrangement, um, you know, that we're gonna have a lot better sell job to the, the trademark office that this is a unique mark um, if we can do that. So, you know, it, it's when you get to descriptive uh, for descriptive marks, I think it's probably always better to stylize your mark a little bit. And, and if you can do a logo, because the more creative you can be in that, in that aspect, it's going to be uh, better for you uh, in protection, uh, whether you register it or not, because it, even if you don't register it, you want someone to stop, they can come back and say, you know what, your, your mark's descriptive. I don't think you have any rights. Um, and so you'll you have to fight that out. So the better uh, the better the better way to do that is to have a, a, a mark that kind of stylized color logo. That that's probably the way to go. Um, next question: If I have recently received my registration for the name of my business, and now I want to register the tagline and the logo, will I need to file two separate applications? Uh. All right, so I'm gonna give you my favorite lawyer answers. Well, it depends, right? So uh, I'm assuming like tagline, like you have uh, like Nike, just do it. Uh, I'm sorry, Nike, I'm borrowing yours, but that's what everybody knows. Um, you could do it either way, right? You could file the tagline apart from the logo or you could do them individually um, because what if you do them together, what they're gonna protect probably is the combination of the two, right? And so think about, Think about this from the aspect of you want to stop someone. So if you have a logo and you want to stop someone, but your registration is the tagline of the logo and they're only using the logo, well, it's going to be a more difficult fight. That doesn't mean we're not going to win, but it'd be a lot better if we just had a registration for the logo or for the tagline. So you don't need to do it in two separate applications, but it may be more beneficial to do it that way. Okay. And I just want to quickly mention if there's extremely specific uh, situational based questions coming through, uh, Patrick did offer his email uh, to our attendees. And once again, that is P Smith at GBC dot law. And next question is, what is the general cost of a provisional patent? Uh, right, so, you know, Generally, uh, I think the, the cost I had up there, I believe, and these change a lot. Uh, let me jump back, right? Uh, so I think it's $150 government fee to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what a patent attorney would charge to do that, um, and, and I should have said this earlier, you don't have to hire an attorney for any of these things. Um, you can do them yourself. Um, as, I, as I mentioned along the way, copyright and trademark applications are pretty straightforward. Um, patent application as well, too, it can be, People do them occasionally on their own, um, but you know, dealing with the patent office is uh, is is uh, is very heavy rules based, and, and things are written a certain way, so it can be uh, difficult to deal with uh, if if you don't understand the rules. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what you're going to pay an attorney to draft an application it could vary wildly. But for a provisional patent, I can tell you in my practice, if we're just filing something short to get something, uh, you know, uh, on file because we have a trade. Uh, show coming up, um, you know, it would probably be a, a, at most a couple thousand dollars. Um, and I and I I just don't like people to use the provisional patent as a way to file something um, first if that's not really the emergency they're dealing with. Um, because it, if at all, it's always better to file the full application because uh, we want to have the the best application as earliest as possible. Um, but you know, provisional application is usually uh, uh, much less expensive. Do you recommend someone getting a U.S. patent for their brand name and then also in another country if they plan to do business in that country? Um, yeah, typically, if you're going to expand outside the U.S. and in, into foreign countries, you may want to look into protection uh, in, in those countries as well so that um, so that you can protect yourself outside the U.S. Um, you know, your, your U.S. rights will protect things from things that come into the U.S. So if someone makes the products in France and brings them in, your rights in the U.S. will, will be able to, even though they were made in France, you can use those. Um, 
So if you start to do a lot of work outside the US, um, that's something that you may want to consider, uh, you know, working uh, and, and uh, protecting yourself in. Is it true that um, there are not patents for software? <laughs> uh, I, I saw this question pop up too. Um, so, that, and that's kind of this, um, you know, a lot of our, we have statutory laws, so we have laws of statute, but then uh, statutes are interpreted by judges. And it seems, in my opinion, that sometimes the judge's opinions kind of undulate like a, a pendulum. Um, and so in the, in the US, there's been this swing against software patents. Um, so the, the, the quick answer here is there is no bar against getting a patent for software, right? You, if you have software, you could potentially get a patent. It's just more difficult than it had been years ago, but it's easier than it's been more recently. Um, you know, there was there was a loss, uh, a, a case that came out in a decision, and one of the things the patent office did is they had approved all these things for patents. Well, they immediately withdrew all the the uh, the, the grants. They said, okay, the notices of allowance are called. They pulled them all back, and they had everyone look relook at all these patents for software. Um, so it was this knee jerk reaction, um, and the uh, the former uh, director of the patent office. Uh, who just uh, who just resigned because of the change in administration? Um, he he was trying to direct the patent office and their procedures and come up with examples and kind of guide the patent office to get to a place where uh, getting a, a software patent is easier. And I, I am of the opinion that that's the case. It is easier now than it had been, let's say, five years ago. Um, it's not as easy as it used to be. But if you have software, it's definitely unique. Um, then the, you can get a patent for it. It just, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a fight and that's, that's okay. There's, we can do that. Sure. If you had to summarize, what is the main differences, uh, between a copyright and a patent? Right. So a copyright is going to protect artistic expression. Um, and a patent is going to protect what's well, the utility patents. It's going to protect what something does. So if you think back to my lamp example. Um, if I had a copyright on that and a, and a patent on that, all right, all right, my patent would get me the ability to stop anyone from making a lamp, right? Uh, the copyright would get, let me stop people from making that lamp, the lamp that looks like that. So, um, they're very different. You could have both on the same thing, but what they protect is very different. Um, copyright lasts much longer. The patent is, is a much a shorter duration. Um, but again, the, the, what something does, how it functions is usually gonna fall into the patent realm. And what something looks like is gonna fall into one of the other ones. If it's something creative, that's copyright. Um, mm -hmm. uh, question is, if we register a letter logo written as the company name, is it necessary to register the company name? So if you have a, a let's see, a letter logo, as the company name. So I guess, uh, is that like the company name is written in a letter design? Um, so that kind of goes to the um, stylized versus word mark. So no, if you if you have a, a design, if the, the name or logo is a specific design and you have that trademark, um, you can get that registered and that's fine. Um, is it necessary to register the company name? No, but if you do, that's a lot better. Right, because if I have a stylized mark and it's a very specific font and colors in a specific way, well, let's say someone takes the company name and changes the font and changes it, looks at it a different way. You know, there when the court looks at it, they're going to say, well, your registration is really only for this stylized version. This person's using it in a different way. So, is someone only going to think uh, your company because of the stylized version, or are they going to think about your company because it's the name? And we don't care what it looks like or how it looks. Um, so, do you have to register? No, you don't have to do any of these things uh, unless you want a patent. But it may be better to do that, or at a minimum, make sure you're using that logo in a kind of more generic way. You're using your name not in this special stylized way, so that you can come in and show. Well, yeah, I have a registration for the logo this way, but I also have use in the in commerce of using it in a, in a less stylized way. So that kind of broadens the protection 
And the things we can say successfully are confusingly similar to what we're doing. All right. All right. And we will end there. Um, if anyone has additional questions that they think of at a later time, later today, or even in the next couple of weeks, please reach out to Patrick. Once again, his email is psmith at GBC law or GBC period law. And I'm posting that again in the chat box for everyone. Patrick, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, you know, Chicago's entrepreneurs are always looking for information like this. So thank you so much for joining our webinar today. It was my pleasure. And I hope uh, everyone is very successful and uh, continues to stay safe. Right, wonderful. Thank you uh, once again, Patrick. And thank you, of course, to our attendees for joining us. We wish you uh, the best of luck. Thank you.